So this next interview is with an old writer friend of mine, a prolific and genius author. Her name is Charlotte O'Farrell. And this is actually the first time that we spoke by voice. It had always been written correspondence. And honestly, I was so excited to talk to her for the first time that I um, forgot to introduce her properly. So what follows is my interview with Charlotte O'Farrell. We talk about her new anthology novella called Postcards from the Body Farm. Really incredible stuff. And yeah, I just, I realized as I was editing that I had uh, forgotten to introduce her. So without further ado, Charlotte O'Farrell. Can we talk about this? It's not a haunting because we made that distinction, but something, something strange that happened to you. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's one of the strangest things, probably the, the, the most scared I've been in my adult life, <laughs> or certainly up there with, with, with some of those experiences. Um, right. So I live in Nottingham a City, but I originally come from a really small town in a place called Lincolnshire, which is very, very rural. Um, it's a farming county, massive open fields and things like that. And I could probably fill a book with some of the strange things that have gone on there. Um, but the strangest one is there's maybe about seven miles outside of my hometown. There's a place called Skidbrook and they have um, a church there, disused church. It's a 13th century church, but it's been out of use since the 70s. And it's it's got a reputation for supposedly being haunted. So sorry. Like so that. just to clarify, it was built in the 13th century and was in use until the 1970s? Yes, that's right. Wow, yes, that's it's... quite a tradition, and then strange for it to be abandoned after so so long. Okay, sorry, yes. please continue. No, 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 it's fine. It's, um, I mean, I'm not sure why it was uh, abandoned. Perhaps they, that, I mean, it, it really is in the middle of nowhere, so it's possible that they didn't have many people going to their services. The parish um, just kind of, yeah. Yeah, quite likely just change in population, really. Um, so, it, I mean, it's maybe it's sort of in the middle of a field, uh, flat all around, you can see it for miles around, and it's surrounded by trees. Um, and we had something, a sort of mini satanic panic there uh, in the early 2000s. Um, I was going to say, when you described the story, it kind of, I was going to ask you about if it was a satanic panic kind of um, feel. Yes. And for the 2000s is, I guess, you know, it kind of took hold of different communities. And, and like, there were places <laughs> that hit it hard in the 70s, all the way through to the, to, you know, quite recently, even today. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I suppose with, with Lincolnshire, quite a sleepy, sleepy little county, maybe it just took a few more decades for it to filter through. <laughs> um, but the, the, it was, it it always been thought of as a supposedly haunted place. Um, but they found animal bones in there and people had drawn pentagrams on the uh, walls and um, just sort of hmm. desecrated it, really. So um, it, it was, it was a, for a while, people were worried or Satanists were using it. We, I didn't take it very seriously at the time because I thought, well, right. this is just hype. This is just the newspapers wanting, you know, something to write about. It's probably kids trying to shock people. Um, and in, sometimes in many communities, that was exactly the case. It was purely, yes. it was a pure hysteria. Absolutely. And I mean, it may well have been, but I did have this right. one experience that changed, maybe sort of scared me a little bit because we'd, we'd been out there in the daytime and seen, you know, that we saw animal bones and we did see all the strange stuff. But again, I was still of the opinion, oh, this is, this is people messing about. Um, so a few sure. years later, my husband, well, boyfriend at the time, husband, uh, and I, we used to drive sort of out there. We used to have these evening drives just to sort of go out into the countryside. Um, and we'd sometimes go past Skidbrook Church and sort of stop and just turn the engine off and just sort of, because it had such a creepy atmosphere, mm. I can't really describe. Um, so we'd get out of the car and sort of listen to it. And we did this once. There were no other cars about. Bear in mind, this is the middle of a field. Um, and we weren't actually in the church. We were just sort of in the field next the to it. property, and right. We, that's right, yeah. And there were no, and no other cars. So, you know, being a few miles away from the nearest town, we thought, well, nobody's about. And we stopped and we you could just hear this really low chanting i mean almost like in a in a horror film you know if they were having a cult or something you know low right. low chanting it was completely dark no cars around no people no sign of people no lights anything just this really strange deep chanting it didn't sound like kids um so we wow. got in the car very very quickly and drove away top speed um i, I would with, imagine so Yes, <laughs> and I don't think we ever went back since. Right. Um, <laughs> and so you said this was as recently as the early 2000s, right? Yeah, that was when, when they started talking about Satanists. This would have been a bit later, so this would probably have been about 2010. Oh, um, so quite recent. So That's interesting. Quite fairly recent, yep. Wow. So I don't know what's going on there. 
But yeah, I didn't stick around to find. I one. appreciate you sharing the story because that, in a way, actually sounds like a, a lead. You know, uh, like possibly ongoing story that could be looked into. So I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I would. I would. Uh, I mean, my parents still live out there, so I could always. Oh, I didn't mean back. to necessarily send you, but uh, you know, <laughs> no, I, no. I was thinking more check through the newsreels myself. But yeah, if you if, if you're in the mood to be a correspondent on the ground, I'm sure we can always <laughs> always oh, use the, the intel. Oh yeah, no, I'd love to go back out there. Um, I think certainly in the daytime, though. <laughs> right, that's that's smart. <laughs> Yeah. And, but I do. I I'm trying to practice my narration voice by reading my own stories and starting my you know own like channel like that, where just the author narrates. And I would encourage you to do the same because your voice is uh, good for it and your stories are good for it. Oh, thank you, thank you. And yeah, if you ever want any stories to narrate, just let me know. And, That's uh, a great idea. To. We can definitely. Um, <laughs> yeah. If 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 you think of anything or you could use a voice like mine, I would definitely be interested in that. Brilliant. No, thank you. I I, I always love hearing my stories read out I've actually there are a couple of times when I've heard my own stories read and it's been done in such an atmospheric way I've thought wow that, that makes what I wrote so much better I, absolutely <laughs> and it really is a special connection when somebody like you can tell that they yeah. are meeting you in your imagination for this thing that didn't happen you know but they, they they're feeling it exactly that same way absolutely. And, and nailing it yeah it's brilliant it really it really is it's an art form so I do I love this title and I think that this is you mentioned a few projects and we can talk about all of them but um, I'm really interested in postcards from the body farm. Yes, um, yes. So this is mostly. I, I mean, I've got as you know a couple of novellas published, but mostly I like my short stories. And postcards from the body farm is my most recent collection of short stories. There's sort of a theme in that there's a wraparound story of a person who works in a what what they call a body farm um where they have right. people different bodies decomposing as a way to show the police and scientists to study how they decompose oh, in different like conditions it's, it's a cadaver science uh, yes thing. yes right <laughs> Absolutely. And I was so freaked out hearing that. I thought, yeah, I've got right. to use that. That's, I mean, can you imagine working in one of those? That is um, an incredible setting. They are. Absolutely. They, they really are. I mean, I think from a scientific pers perspective, it must be really interesting to work there. But, you know, how do you sort of get r around the fact that you're working with decomposing bodies all day? Uh, I don't imagine it smells very nice either. Right. Um, so I think you have to have a strong stomach for it. Um, but I thought, you know, this would be so great to have as a as a setting and there's a wraparound story where the narrator um gets a visit from different ghosts i suppose who want to tell their stories and so each story is supposedly uh. narrated by a different person so I, I i quite like that you you can have films where there are anthology films and things like that i think it's quite cool if you have i was going to say exactly the same where i am i'll do novellas just to kind of practice that length yes. um but short stories are bread and butter and uh very, like the most fun for me to write and for that yes. reason i anthologies are really important to me and for my listeners charlotte o'farrell is prolific when it comes to short stories and anthologies um i actually we haven't even gotten to this is the, the new the new one that we're talking about is postcards from the body farm but i forget a year or two ago i uh, personally reviewed bleak midwinter which was a christmas collection yes and sorry i yeah. won't get too off topic before we get back to postcards from the body farm but it was amazing. It's incredible the way that you write on on a theme and are just consistent in terms of it being an interesting premise that evolves. It's it's it really is impressive. Thank you, thank you. That, that means a lot. I, I really love Christmas horror. Uh, I actually have a second a second volume of Bleak Me Winter that I'm hoping will be ready in time for the season. Um, ah, that was the one so that that we discussed that, that's still in development. That's right, yes, because I just I think it's such a brilliant time for horror. Obviously, Halloween is another obvious one, but right. I think Christmas horror has that. There, there's enough in there. There's enough to really keep you going for forever. Really, I think you think you could always set. The, the setting is so special, and um, I, I've tried like a very few seasonal themed stories, and it's very challenging because you have to balance those those disparate emotions. Yes, but, but done right, it's very, very satisfying. I think I think absolutely right. Uh, that's that's spot on what you said about you know disparate emotions, uh, especially with you know people's families visiting and uh, they might be traveling, they might be uh, 
uh, longing for somebody or something or somewhere. Uh, there's just so much you can put in there. Um, and people also, you know, if they're bereaved, they will be thinking, oh, this time last Christmas I was with that person. So, yeah, oh, absolutely. True. It's the heightened emotions all, all the way through and all of these traditions that we have um, that we can either play with or or follow or, or choose not to follow. Um, and I, I, and I hadn't thought about what you just mentioned about it being kind of a time of ghosts, even traditionally. Yes. I hadn't right. considered it that way, but that's absolutely true. Yes, I mean, going all the way back to uh, Dickens and Christmas Carol. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, I've heard in the past, I don't know how true it is, that they used to tell ghost stories around the fire on Christmas Eve in a time mm. when before Halloween was so so commonly celebrated right. in the way it is today. So I'm, I, I think it's it's not surprising in a way, but I think it's underdeveloped. Oh. Certainly um, things like Easter horror could be underdeveloped as well. Have you, I mean, have you written on Easter horror? I don't think I've caught that. Uh, so. <laughs> I've written one. Uh, it was a short story about a, a Easter egg hunt on oh, um, that's good. a stately home. Yeah, and they, and they One of the kids went missing, and years later they found her um, grown up, but uh, dead oh, wow. grown up and she'd been taken in by the owner of the stately home kidnapped more or less and that, it, which it sounds really sick when i say it out loud right. <laughs> I, <laughs> and that well i i'll compliment you first on that took a twist that i didn't expect when you set it up i was like and then they find the kids bones or something but then you took it in a new direction and the other thing i was going to say is i recently shared a story about like uh, a serial killer who uh, accidentally confesses while he's under under anesthetic and i narrated it myself and my my mother, who's a who's a big fan, and and even I'll say manages me a little bit in terms of the promotion. Uh, she read it and she was like, "David, I don't like when you write. like. Why did you Why did you do this? Because like, it's, it's just a short story where I'm like, yeah, I killed those people, and I guess I'm confessing to it. So yeah, no, that's when you say it when you say it out loud, it does it does uh, seem stranger, but. But people tend to be surprised, I find, when, when I say, oh, I write horror. If they know me from something else or they know me through work or, or whatever, and I say, oh, I write horror stories, they, they, they either say, wow, that's really cool, and, you know, they're right. big horror fans themselves, or they sort of look at you like, oh, are you secretly a serial killer? Um, no. It's usually one or the other. Do you, do you find that? Oh, absolutely. I, um, the joke I tell is that uh, before I got married, when I was dating, I actually had to announce to new people that I was like horror was a big part of my life. And I remember talking to my roommate and saying, like, yeah, I told her, I told this date that I wrote horror stories. Um, and it seemed to turn her off. Like, should I say, like, I write scary stories? And my roommate saying, no, that's worse. That sounds way worse. <laughs> and us, us, like, kind of workshopping how I would break this news to people. <laughs> thrillers. I suppose you could say, I write thrillers. That sounds a little bit yes, more... Yes, that, is actually, yeah, that okay. is actually something I've started to lean on. <laughs> we actually arrived at the same solution there. That's interesting. There you go. So I think I think thriller. Um, I mean, really, what is what are thrillers apart from horror stories? But uh, they seem to sort of be a bit more prestigious, I suppose. Or I mean, people write crime stories. That's just right. as messed up as horror, right? Yeah, um, right. <laughs> so there are worse things we could be writing, but I, I think it's one of those genres people either love or they stay away from generally. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty understandable. My wife doesn't like horror at all. She'll she'll no. humor me occasionally. What is your favorite short from Postcards from the Body Farm? And you don't have to um, spoil anything if you don't uh, want to. But like, can you pitch pitch me one of these shorts? Uh, yes, th there are two, but I'll I'll go through them quickly. Um, take there's your, take one. Your time. Uh, called Lunar Body Farm. Now, this is set in the future when uh, the moon is colonized the, the, and Mars is colonized. And uh, this this young graduate goes out to the moon because she needs something on her resume about, you know, having worked off, off the world. And um, she goes to where they're growing synthetic humans for, for transplants and things. Um, and I oh. won't ruin it, but I really love how, how it went with with the creepy idea that they're in this sort of sterile environment and uh, she's there on her own just watching them to make sure they're breathing and things like that. And wow. um, thing, yeah. things go down. <laughs> things go yeah, down. right. The second story from Postcards from the Body Farm. Yes. Uh, the second one is called Lambing Season. And Lambing this season. one is uh, completely different. Um, it's, it's basically, a, I'm not going to spoil it, but yeah, it's mm. a group of children going to a farm and they're having lambing season. So they're helping the farmer. What, yeah. what does that refer to? Oh, so when the lambs are being born. Um, so when they're being born, it's basically making sure that they're safely born and cleaning them off and just basically helping the mother. Uh, to okay, to right. make sure that she doesn't sense. bleed out. 
Um, but on this particular lambing season, they keep coming out and they're coming out with two heads or, you know, several eyes and wow, the children okay. start screaming and something's gone horribly wrong. And then there's another twist at the end. Um, That's which cool. That's very takes, compelling. <laughs> thank you. It takes it onto another another level of horror. Um, it's a very short story. I think that one's probably only two or three pages, but... I was quite happy with with the way it escalates and the sort of. Oh, I might have to idea. buy my own copy of this one then, because that is that's I like that setup a lot. And then that last one that we talked about, I thought I knew what your ending was going to be, and it was something completely different. So, oh, brilliant! Thank that's... you. Oh well, if you want, if you need a copy, I can send you one. Uh, maybe if you'd be happy to review it, that would be great. Ah, uh, sure. I, that that would be a great deal. I'd I'd be happy to do that for sure. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely, and um. No, it's always a pleasure. I, I'm, you are my favorite author to get um, advanced copies from. Oh, thank down. you. Well, I shouldn't say that. Maybe I'll cut that out. Because I, <laughs> I think I've interviewed other people who may think that they they are my favorite. But <laughs> You can say I'm one of your favorites. Well, yeah, one that's favorite. right. <laughs> right, right, right. No, I really do. I, I seriously, I, I, I love your style so much where it's like, it's exactly why I got into this genre where it's like just a tight story and it, it builds and then subverts expectations. It's, it really, um, you have it down to a, a craft. Oh, thank you. So well, that really does mean a lot. It really does. Cause I think it can sometimes be, be a bit of a, a, a slog doing these, this, these stories, you know, you yeah. have to fit it in around everything else in your life. Everything and, else, um, yeah. Yeah, and it, it can be hard, uh, but no, that that really does mean a lot. I'm I'm trying at the moment to write more novellas and uh, maybe mm. a novel length, but I I just find it so much easier to write the short stories and, and so much more enjoyable in the sense exactly. that you know you're working on it for maybe a couple of weeks and then that's it. It's I, done. Yeah, exactly. And then you can fine tune it, have every word exactly how it should be. You can engineer it. I don't know. I guess you know. The, the truly great writers do that with novels too, but no, I'm the same way. I'm trying to finish a novella this year, but yeah, short stories are always going to be my love. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you do Nano Rimo in. Yes, I think November. you, you maybe even encourage me to get into that. And this novella that I'm finishing is um, something that I started and failed to complete in Nano Rimo 2019, actually. Oh wow! So I'm not That's very good at it, but I do try to participate occasionally. You, you hit it hard, though, right? I did. I, well, in 2011, I actually managed to get the 50 words, uh, 50 words, 50,000 50, words. 50,000, right. Yeah. Um, but that was, that was, I mean, at the time I was working part time. I hadn't, uh, I didn't have uh, children yet, so um, it was easier to fit Oh, in. that's right. Um, I, I do, I do find it a good way of making sure I write every night, though. I haven't hit the fifty thousand words since, but it, it, in November, and you know, it's all cold, and you're not sort of going out right. in the evening as much. It's brilliant. It is. I, sh I should try to set up and be ready on my mark to at least attempt to hit it. Um, yes, because it is. It is. It's very good exercise. Um, Definitely it does produce uh, interesting, interesting stuff. Where can listeners find find you? What, what are your main uh, hubs? They can check you out. Um, well, everything I've written is available on Amazon. Um, you can also find me on Goodreads. Um, I have a website, charlotteofarrell.com, which I don't update as often as I should, but I should get back on that. Um, okay, but that sure. has a list of some of my short stories as well. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And it, was there anything else that you wanted to cover? Again, I apologize for the technical issues. I think I think that we should have plenty um no, no, brilliant. I mean, we can we can talk about uh, neuro horror if if you'd like. Yes, to that I w one. I would love to, and I was about to say. Um, okay, so uh, Charlotte and I know each other from Modern Dread Neuro Horror, which was um, I I don't want to put words in your mouth, but for me, it was a huge passion project. That was one of the first books I ever produced, like where I was organizing artists. Uh, I think it's a really important and interesting book that that we made together. Absolutely. I mean, you were a pleasure to work with. Um, and I think we came out with, I was really pleased with, with what we came out with. Um, it was the first novella I'd written and actually finished. Oh, that's right. Um, so it was brilliant to actually finish something that long. Um, and the title and, of that one was All We Lost, is that right? Yes, All We Lost, that's right. It's about uh, podcasters who travel to a remote town uh, to investigate a mass disappearance that's happened a few years before. Um, and it was one of four, I think, four, there were four novellas in there. That's right. Um, I, mine was uh, The Lossy Incident, which was very experimental. I actually, so if you buy this book today, you will get a later edition in which, among other fixes, I, um, I took out an unfinished puzzle. It was supposed to be like an ARG, 
and like three dimensional and interactive. And um, I didn't even finish one of the puzzles. So there's just a chapter that doesn't make any sense and doesn't go anywhere. And I kind of realized that <laughs> later. I was like, oh, this is one of the three dimensional aspects that I actually didn't stitch together. So um, I actually took that out now. So if you have a copy, which I think you probably do, because I think, um, you know, we all got copies when it first came out. Chapter 16 or so is now deleted in current versions. And then our co-writers, Micah Edwards and Derek Hawk. Uh, also, also did novellas, and I unfortunately I don't have their blurbs in front of me. But it really was; it was incredible. Our cover artist was uh, incredible. Um, that project's really special to me, and I am actually really happy to hear. I, I forgot, I guess, that that was your first novella because uh, it's solid. It's great. It's um, it's cool. It has your style where it like you know, there's kind of a dawning realization of how messed up things are. It's it's it totally works, and so I'm like honored to kind of have hosted it in that way. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was great. And, and I think all the four fit together really well. Uh, they were all slightly weird, slightly yeah. offbeat, which I think is great. It was very experimental as a, as, a, um, as a volume. So yeah, and that's another thing I think makes it really special. Yes, yeah, really great. I was very proud of how that one came out. Um, and that's also available on uh, Amazon. Uh, it, has, it has like illustration inserts from all of us. It really, that's one I'm proud of as well. Um, thank you for reminding me to talk about that, because I was about to wrap up, and I forgot about the, one of the coolest things that we've collaborated on. <laughs> Although we ha we've actually collaborated on a few things at this point. Yeah, if you ever do anything like that in the future, I'd, I'd definitely Absolutely. be happy to, to work with you again. And thank you. Thank you for your time tonight.